welcome everyone to today's event on equity-focused inclusive teaching in STEM. My name is Kate Diamond. I work with the CERTL Network. We are hosting this event along with Katie Kearns and Francesca White from Indiana University. They'll be moderating today's discussion featuring Kristen Miller from the University of Georgia and Sarah Rodriguez from Iowa State University. This is the third and final event in our Topics in STEMinism series on strategies for inclusive undergraduate STEM education. And today we'll be focused on, on, on classroom applications of inclusive teaching. So thanks so much for joining us. If you're new to CERTL, we are the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, and we are actually a nationwide network of universities across the U.S. and in Canada working to teach STEM grad students and postdocs effective, inclusive teaching methods so that they can become both excellent researchers and teachers. And um, given that that's our goal, today's event is very much um, uh, in the spirit of the work that we do. You can learn more about what we do and the universities that are a part of our network by going to our website. At this point, because I have a very congested and hoarse voice, <laughs> I will turn things over to our moderators so that you don't have to listen to me. Um, I will be in the, the, the room throughout the event to provide any technical support that's needed. If you have trouble hearing our speakers, please let me know in the chat window. And uh, I'd encourage folks to introduce themselves as well right now in the chat window. Since we do have people joining us from all over the country, go ahead and let us know your name and your institution so that we can see who we'll be learning alongside of today. Thanks, Kate. And if any of you are joining us as a watch party or a group of people, if you could let us know how many of you there are with your group, that would be really helpful, too. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Kearns. I work here in the, um, at Indiana University of Bloomington. And we're really glad to have you join us today to talk about inclusive teaching strategies, both as a big idea and philosophy of approaches, as well as the really practical kinds of um, strategies that we might um, put into our classrooms. So we're glad to have you join us today. Um, we know from the registration list that we checked on yesterday that um, there's a lot of graduate students joining us today. Um, so we hope that we'll be providing a lot of practical ideas for you to think about in your classrooms and in your laboratory and other kinds of communities. We also have some faculty, some staff, some postdocs joining us as well. And everybody's coming from a wide range of um, life, mathematical, um, geosciences, psychological, and social sciences. So we're glad to have you all here. We're going to give you a little practice run at some of our interactive features, but we also want to find out a little bit about you and your familiarity before we get started with today. So we have a, just a quick poll question to find out about your familiarity and experiences with inclusive teaching practices in STEM. A, for very familiar, B, with some familiarity, or C, this is totally new. Um, and if we could just use the poll, the drop-down ABC items, and I can see them coming in already. So thank you. Mark myself is not away. I'm actually here. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I know that there are about 30 people here in the room right now. So I'm hoping to see close to 30 responses. Well, it's about 20 people chiming in. It's right evenly across the board. Some people who are very familiar and have taken classes, some people with some familiarity, and um, an even distribution of people who are new to this topic, too. Thank you for sharing your background and experiences. We hope that this will be a useful topic to you. I'm going to turn the baton over to Francesca, who's going to provide us with a little bit of um, framing and context, and a little bit of the philosophy about how we're approaching our um, webinar today. Thanks, Katie. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. We first want to situate this idea of improving instruction and more broadly improving undergraduate STEM education and sort of these different um, approaches to doing change. So on the slide here, there are four different points at which people are looking to make change in undergraduate education. 
And most of this workshop is geared towards more of the curriculum and pedagogy and reflective teacher practice. But there's also folks working on improving policy, such as incorporating reward structures um, for faculty and future faculty, and shared vision work. So people working collaboratively to identify what do we want instruction and learning to look like in our classroom. So we often get asked the question, what is the best thing, like what's the best practice that we can use in our class right away? And um, there's a review done by Henderson and colleagues, and they sort of outlined, we know that these things don't work. Going to one-time workshops, much like this one, um, using already pre-made pre curriculum and materials and whatnot, and also thinking about the teacher level, sort of having limited ideas and beliefs about learning, thinking about the scientist identity and where teaching falls in with that, and also top-down policies. So in a department, for example, people mandating that you have to teach a particular way. But what does work and what we hope to encourage is thinking through how can you get involved with long-term development and implementation of things. <clears throat> and also this long-term um, reflective process practice, so thinking about improving instruction and making classrooms more equitable as a long-term goal. And so really quickly, you may have already read this article uh, by Freeman and colleagues about active learning strategies. Um, trying to increase the use of active learning strategies in STEM classrooms to improve performance in STEM. But that's really just the starting place, and it doesn't necessarily get at inclusion. And some of our speakers are going to be, or both of our speakers are going to talk about inclusion and equity. But we want to provide just a few points about what that means um, from our perspective. So inclusive classrooms are about equitable success. And this is not for one group over another group. This is about equitable access to success for all students. And it's also about making explicit connections to um, STEM in society, thinking about intercultural knowledge and learning about the many ways in which people go about learning about the natural world and doing science. And it's also thinking about learning as a cultural experience and engaging those sort of human aspects of learning, such as thinking about identity, values, and interests. And we have a book here called Who's Asking, and it's talking about indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems, and science education. So there is work that spans across STEM disciplines and the soci sociocultural sort of ideas. And that's what we're thinking about when we're talking about inclusive and equity-focused teaching. And so now we're going to start with Dr. Kristen Miller um, to share what she has. And we're focusing this presentation mostly on what are some key takeaways that you can walk away with this presentation to help you build on this long-term journey, recognizing that this one-time workshop is not going to be sufficient for wrestling with these ideas that often take some time. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton to Dr. Miller. Okay. I have this virtual baton. Thank you. Okay. So um, I would also like to welcome everyone who's here today. And I very much appreciate um, your attention and your excitement about these topics. Um, I thought I'd introduce myself by trying to frame why I'm an appropriate person um, to help facilitate this particular discussion. <clears throat> so in terms of STEM, um, at the University of Georgia, I'm the director of the Biological Sciences Division. So I oversee the biology major, um, which is the largest major at UGA. We have about 2,400 declared majors. And I focus a lot of my time on um, pedagogy training for a variety of different instructors, graduate students, undergrad teaching interns. Um, I'm very involved in peer learning assistance right now, faculty, and postdocs. And something else that I do in, in conjunction with CERTL and these pedagogy efforts is I help mentor uh, CERTL projects, scholarship and teaching and learning projects for graduate students and postdocs. And all of this folds under my uh, research domain of biology education research. So um, what I'm going to focus a lot on uh, for the next 
about nine minutes or so, um, are strategies that I'm actually using with my peer learning assistants. These are undergraduates who are volunteering to assist in large lecture introductory biology classrooms to help facilitate uh, the learning process. And the way in which they do that may vary per course or per instructor, but all of these students take a one credit pedagogy course with me on um, what needs to be considered to be an effective um, peer learning assistant. And so this slide that I have up here is actually, um, when I was first approached to do this talk today, these were the three questions I was asked to address. But um, as we honed in on today's date, really the focus became this question at the bottom in blue. Um, lots of people, I guess, ask for practical examples of things that I'm doing in the classroom. So I will focus on that in the context of the first question, equity-oriented, inclusive teaching. Okay, so um, anything, there's a little blue bullseye on the screen next to familiarize yourself. And um, if you had to leave this session with take home strategies or things to remember, these are the bullseyes, okay? And um, so these are th practical things that I think any, any and all of us could do and need to do on a continual basis. So when I first started addressing the peer learning assistance on uh, issues related to equity and inclusion in the classroom, I had to familiarize myself with common vocabulary. And um, I needed to do that in order to help the peer learning assistants understand the topic that we were going to be talking about. So generally, I would say familiarize yourself with common vocabulary. Starting from the beginning, when I lead workshops for the PLAs or faculty or postdocs, I talk about differences between equality and equity because I do hear people using them interchangeably. Um, and, and I remind them that equality means giving everyone the same resources, but equity means giving everybody access to the resources they need individually to learn and to thrive. And I often use this particular um, uh, image to go along with that, but there are many images out there that, that can help describe this, the differences here. Um, Something else that I do and I think is, is a really nice exercise for educators is to do a little bit of self-assessment about um, classroom equity strategies in teaching and in learning. And I'm going to em emphasize that a lot, that I want to go beyond the phrase of equity in teaching and I want to talk about equity in learning as well. because. What we do affects our students and how they learn and their willingness to learn. And I think that's really important to remember that you can encourage um, inclusive learning practices within your classroom as well. So um, this is an article that I have used before that has a really nice self-evaluation tool within the article. Um, and it's a very generalizable article. It's easy to digest. It brings up uh, 21 teaching strategies for promoting inclusion in the classroom. And it gives you an opportunity, um, if you see on the bottom right here, it's a little bit small, but this is how you would score each category. Never use it, use occasionally, use it regularly, or would like to try. So it gives you an overall uh, context of maybe where you stand in particular currently but you can also keep using this assessment to see how things change across semesters or across teaching assignments. Okay. <clears throat> um, after introducing people to vocabulary and doing the self-assessment and talking about those results, um, one thing that I do in particular, and, and this is, I'm going to warn you, this is a little bit delicate um, because the issues of equity in the classroom can be very delicate for everyone involved. I have an exercise I do in particular um, because I want to give the PLAs or whomever faculty a little bit of taste of inequitable statements in STEM. And um, these, are, these are statements that I have collected and a faculty colleague in the College of Education has collected over the years 
that we have overheard faculty saying, um, student teachers, K-12 teachers, um, uh, students in the classroom um, that uh, show some degree of possible inequity in the actual statements. Whether the person who is saying them meant it to be that way or not. So um, I provided on the right hand side here as you can kind of read through those um, <clears throat> four examples and I have a collection of about 25. I cut them on, put them on strips of paper, I cut them out and I have um, every student in the class or faculty member or whatever workshop I'm delivering, um, I give them randomly and then I ask everybody to stand up and they have to circulate around the room however they want but they have to reach every single person in that room and they need to look them in the eye and they need to read the statement. And it's, um, it's a very powerful experience. Um, and if you are going to do this, I would suggest uh, waiting until you have uh, created an environment that is safe for people to be able to um, start sweating a little bit or feel a little bit uncomfortable about um, these particular statements that they're, that they're being asked to read. I need a group reflection after just to talk about what were you thinking when you read these statements. And it is, is very powerful. Again, I use that word. For some people, this is the, the first time they've ever heard anything like this. And for other people, it's a reaffirming time because they have experienced these types of comments. Um, putting things in practice, I think it is a great idea to set uh, your expectations up front for an equitable teaching and learning environment, but don't set them up if you're not going to follow through. Okay, so you really need to think about if you put something in your syllabus or you state something to students or you write to them about something, how are you going to follow through and how are you actually going to assess these goals of equity and inclusion? So some practical examples, um, you may want to include a uh, pronoun preference statement in your syllabus or write an email to your students a couple days before a classroom, a class is start asking them if they have um, pronoun preferences, and then act on that. Ask. Some students will reach out, some will not, but the step has been taken and you need to follow through. Um, reminding students consistently that your classroom is a safe environment for discussion um, and that if a student does not feel safe to discuss certain topics, they need to come to you and possibly talk that out so that you can revise what you're doing in the classroom. And um, I think it's a great idea to actually look at your own institutions and find out what is the institution norm for inclusive terms. In other words, as an example, right now I'm building a survey for a research project and I just contacted our uh, representative for inclusion and diversity to say, if I want people to self-identify, <clears throat> what does the university say about that? What are the categories we should be using? Um, how do we structure the questions so that everybody feels included just within that survey practice? Um, I would say that your discourse matters tremendously when you're talking about inclusion uh, and equity in STEM classrooms. It's important for you to think about what you're saying to students, why you're saying it, and how you're saying it. You want to be able to acknowledge all students can participate in science and really give those students who have historically um, been a little bit left behind in opportunities to feel that they can excel um, if given the right environment. The two ways that I do this uh, with the PLAs and faculty is I have an exercise where I actually have them record their discourse, segments of discourse with students or student groups in class, and then go back and analyze that discourse for the types of questions that they're asking, who they're asking the questions to, and the types of responses that they're getting. And what I'm trying to get practitioners to do is to think about 
adjustments that you could make or they could make to potentially uh, open up the doors for greater um, freedom for discussion from all of your students. Another thing that I do is I try to get practitioners to think about mindset in STEM classes. So uh, first doing a self-analysis about uh, an experience you've had that triggers a particular mindset about learning science or learning STEM, um, a STEM topic. So is there something that immediately shuts you down from learning something or have you been in a, a situation where you feel like you can continually learn more and are able to do that? And if you can self-analyze that, then you can start thinking about things that your students may be struggling with as well. Okay, so I, I don't want to run into um, Sarah's time and I'm super excited for her talk. I provided my contact information and I look forward to um, answering any questions or being part of a discussion in just a little bit. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for sharing some of the um, practical, the ways that you think about um, equity and inclusion in your program and in classrooms that you oversee, and um, also the practices that you use for training people, both um, undergraduates, teaching assistants, and the faculty for working in the classroom. Um, so this is the time in which we can um, ask some questions of Dr. Miller. There's two ways, actually three ways. There's a whiteboard there where you can use the little symbol with the A with the lines next to it to write an anonymous question. Um, you can uh, write a question in the chat window if you want. You can also raise your hand and we can call on you and um, you can ask your question now. And this will take just a, we'll give you a few seconds to think. It usually takes a few seconds for people to feel ready to ask a question. Okay, so um, I see a couple questions popping up and one is being typed right now. Um, the first one, do I see undergraduates, TAs, faculty struggling differently with equity practices? That's a great question. Um, yes, I do. And <clears throat> part of the reason for that, um, I believe, is at least in my position in dealing with the population of, of instructors that I have, is that um, there is just a, a wide difference in experiences that these individuals have had related to equity and inclusion. So, um, for example, for right now, undergraduates, um, you know, they're the ones right now that we're thinking about, we're, we're um, talking about these issues, and so they may be more, uh, it may be more tangible to them and for them, um, and therefore they may be more willing to talk about certain things, whereas um, faculty, I mean, I'm a faculty member, but I'll flat out say that these are a lot of these things faculty have never, ever thought about, or they may have noticed but ignored them. And so um, sometimes the struggles that I see people facing are, um, working to try to deal with something new versus um, uh, like a mindset of, you know, everything's been fine up to date, why do I have to deal with this now? Um, versus and actually thinking about, well, you know, some students in the class, if they're quiet or whatever, I'm just going to focus on the ones that are really active um, and realizing that they can't do that or they shouldn't do that. Um, so, yes, I do see a lot of differences. Um, <clears throat> so, the next question is recommendations for helping students develop inclusive uh, mindsets or dealing with exclusionary comments in class. So, um, I'm going to answer the second one first. Exclusionary comments in class um, can uh, theoretically be shut down quickly by you as instructors 
if you are aware of them. Um, if you're teaching a class of 250 students and you this is going on in some part of the room where you can't be at that time, you may never know um, that it's happening. However, I, I feel that it is your responsibility to consistently remind students of your expectations for etiquette in the class, exclusionary comments, and to create um, a safe environment to let students know they can come to you um, with particular concerns or questions. And developing that rapport over time will open the door for the students to come, hopefully. Um, uh, recommendations for helping students to develop inclusive mindsets. Um, the main thing that I can say off the top of my head is um, it's sort of what Francesca talked about at the beginning. It's not a one-shot deal, okay? So if you set the standard or the tone for your class, you need to find ways to consistently bring students back to your standards for the classroom. Um, and sometimes that might be including parts of your lectures or labs that talk about or deal with issues of equity or inclusion in the context of whatever you're teaching. It takes a little time. You might have to do a little bit of research or um, maybe you um, have come in, somebody come in and speak for five minutes or you create a um, discussion blog or something where students can write anonymously about this particular topic um, and why and how um, it is affecting their learning in the classroom. Have you gotten any pushback from students or PLAs about equity focused content or practices? Um, I have not. I, um, I feel very fortunate actually because when I started this training course for PLAs, um, the equity and inclusion piece was the smallest piece of the course because I am not an expert in it and I'm learning all the time. It's one of the reasons I'm super excited for Sarah's um, talk coming up or Sarah's portion of this session. Um, and I am really big on feedback. So in asking students along the way, what did you like about the class? What do you wish we did more of? Um, the number one answer every single time for the PLAs was we want more on equity and inclusion and how to, how to deal with that in the classroom. Um, so that unit, which started as a two-week unit, is now taking up over a third of my class. Um, with the exercises I, I talked about earlier today, um, but also a variety of other ways to explore equity in the classroom. Um, we have more, I haven't heard anything from students, <clears throat> um, but I have had more students approach our PLAs and faculty about things like pronoun choice or asking um, about specific ways to learn material or working in groups and things like that. Any good resources for analyzing your discourse questioning um, with students? Uh, the resources that I use are ones that I've actually created for context of the, the groups that I'm working with in terms of the training. Um, I see Jan, I think, has written in about mindsets, understanding mindsets. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has particular uh, say, you know, uh, published and um, protocols that they use or analysis protocols that they use, I would love for you to provide them. I, I don't have them, um, but I am happy to share any of these exercises with you, Sertl, um, so that you can post them. I do give students kind of a rubric to think about their questioning strategies, types of questions they're using, who they're directing them to, et cetera, um, so that they do have something to follow. Thanks so much, Dr. Miller, for sharing so much of your resources and, and answering these questions. And 
to let people know that we do post the slides, and I think um, checking in with Kate that we can post some extra materials too that um, might go along with this slide set. And I just realized my scroll on the chat was way up near the top, so I missed that there's some conversation going on um, that Francesca and I both act as Google jockeys. When somebody mentions something useful that's on the web, we go hunt it down for you and put a link in the chat window. So we'll keep track of those things as we keep going. Um, I think this is a good time to transition over to Dr. Rodriguez, who is joining us to share some um, thoughts and experiences and ideas related to um, inclusion and specific students and in a, in a community college context. So I'll pass the baton over to Dr. Rodriguez. Great. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Fabulous. Perfect. So. Man, I, I could just listen. Kristen, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I really wish that we could have all of the students on all of the projects that I do go through the training. Um, that would be really lovely. And I think that, that the first presentation rolls really nicely into some of the things that I'm going to talk about in the area that I'm really passionate about, uh, which is STEM identity um, and best practices. So really thinking about STEM identity, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by that, um, and how we can utilize these elements of identity to create equitable and inclusive STEM environments. So um, a little bit of overview about what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, my research and current projects so you can have an idea about where I'm coming from. Um, and then I'll do two things here because we do have to be uh, somewhat brief. And so the first of which will be looking at STEM identity, particularly thinking about women and underrepresented minority students. Um, so looking at definitions of that, the importance of intersectionality and what that means in our higher ed context. Um, and then finally, to what you all are really looking for is those best practices. Um, and looking at best practices uh, from individual interactions to classroom uh, interactions, um, and really beyond, again, with the classroom, you know, the classroom is just one area. Uh, so really thinking about pushing these best practices both in and out of the classroom. And then finally looking at system levels, um, because the people who are on this webinar, you all are shaping the way that tomorrow is going to look. We may have, you know, had barriers or, or issues that we're dealing with right now, but there's really an opportunity for all of us to be able to shift the climate and to shift um, our way of thinking in terms of uh, what it means to be in this uh, context. So about my work, my work focuses on identity, uh, specifically for students in higher education. Um, and I come at this with a race, ethnicity, gender um, sort of slant and background, um, looking at it particularly for STEM students. And I do um, also look at it in terms of the role of community colleges and STEM in creating equitable outcomes as well. So both contexts, community college and four-year institutions. Um, you can learn more about my work and follow me on Twitter, and I have a website as well um, if you're looking for any publications uh, specifically about STEM and identity. Uh, you can find those on uh, my website. In terms of where I'm coming from with current projects, um, I am affiliated with four different uh, NSF projects that are really looking at STEM identity um, and understanding STEM identity in the process of you know, the network level or the department level or the student program level. So everything that I'm going to talk about is really coming uh, from these particular projects. Okay, so STEM identity. So what do I mean when I say STEM identity? So when I say identity, this is really how one understands and positions oneself in a particular culture. And in this instance, in STEM, um, so how you come to recognize yourself as a scientist or as a computer scientist, um, you know, and how also other people recognize you in that culture because it's one thing for you to believe that you're a scientist or for you to feel good about that, but if others aren't necessarily recognizing you, that's where some disconnect comes in, uh, particularly for women and underrepresented students in this area. Um, STEM, if we look at it uh, in terms of identity, is really how a student becomes, and not just students, but faculty, everyone, um, how individuals become 
associated or alienated from this STEM community um, and either are kind of brought in in terms of norms and cultures are, or are very much marginalized uh, from this community. And like I note here, particularly for women and underrepresented students, this is really important because if we look back to the history of STEM and, you know, the, the vast years that STEM has been masculine, has been traditionally white and, you know, in many contexts in the United States, westernized, um, we see that sometimes crafting a STEM identity and really feeling a part of this community can be really quite difficult. Um, and sometimes people are actively pushing individuals, uh, whether they know this or not, out of that community. So STEM identity is really key to us understanding how we can create equitable outcomes uh, so that we can keep individuals in STEM um, and really start to shift the culture around um, what it means to be in the STEM community. Okay, so the, the next thing that I want to bring up in terms of STEM identity is really focusing on intersectionality um, and why that's important to STEM identity. So understanding that your students, um, your faculty, the people that are coming into this STEM community are, are coming with a variety of identities. Uh, so they're not just a student, you know, you are a woman and a student or, you know, a student with a disability or perhaps, you know, you have a culture that is particularly sometimes not valued um, in the culture that you're currently in. People are coming together with intersectional and complex identities. Um, so at the micro level, this looks like the fact that people are complex um, and through that they have unique experiences. Um, so for instance, if you're a woman of color in STEM, you may experience issues of not only um, racism but also sexism and those two things coming together to create a unique experience um, based on different kinds of you know oppressive forces that are coming down on you. Um, in terms of a macro level this can really marginalize groups such as women um, or underrepresented students or individuals as women of color. Um, and we have to be cognizant that people are coming with these various intersectional identities. Um, so we have to ensure that the environments that we're creating not only honor those identities, which is great, um, but that we're continuously trying to break down any barriers um, that might prevent uh, people with intersectional identities um, from being able to really engage with that context. And why this is particularly important in higher ed is that we should be taking this holistic approach to building identity. Um, so thinking about the process of being an undergraduate, you know, going into either faculty or industry, um, thinking about this entire process as an approach to building identity. Um, we don't want to oversimplify people's identities. Um, and we have to understand that people are coming to this context with a variety of identities. Um, and that we really need to understand in order to best serve them. Um, looking at it and looking at these issues in terms of identity, we can also push towards what I have here as inclusive excellence. You may have heard of this term. Um, and it's about shifting the responsibility for advancing diversity, you know, away from a single person or an office, um, really to a cross campus. So that's really why, why you're here. Um, and this can be really key when thinking about why we need to study identity, why we need to care about people from various backgrounds um, being not only at the table, but really pushing back against any barriers that might be there that prevent them from coming to the table in the first place. Okay, in terms of best practices, and I know that, you know, um, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to get to some of these. Um, in terms of the individual level, I want to echo what Kristen was saying in terms of the self-study. So really trying to be reflective about the work that you do. So thinking about it at an individual level. So you as an educator, um, taking time to self-study, you know, thinking about the identities that you hold. Um, you know, do you have marginalized identities yourself? So are you a woman or an underrepresented 
individual in STEM, um, you know, what sort of privileges you've had along the way that may have helped you to, you know, feel like a scientist or feel like an engineer. Um, and then really trying to think of this experience as, you know, an identity building time and trying to encourage intersectional identity throughout the process um, so that you're not only building technical skills in students, but that you're also building the sort of feeling of, I am a scientist um, and I'm a woman scientist and that's good and that's honored. Uh, the last thing here is about um, being proactive with connecting with students. So not waiting for students to come to you, but really being proactive in the way that you set expectations um, about an inclusive climate. So putting it in your syllabus, very upfront, setting ground rules at the beginning, um, being responsive to those ground rules, and really providing a feedback loop um, so that those students know that this is something that you care about. On the classroom level, this is really um, where you have the opportunity to honor multiple perspectives and to also be able to have students show their identities um, and really be honored in their individuality as complex beings by the way that you set your classroom up. So whether that's scaffolded learning, so giving people the opportunity to like do project-based learning or collaborative projects where they get a little bit at a time and then eventually they're able to do things on their own. Um, whether that means allowing, you know, multiple individuals to lead at different times so that they can like really see themselves as a scientist or see themselves in the role um, of whatever you're trying to do. Um, the last thing on here is looking at, oh, and the middle thing is about the multiple perspectives. So I get a lot of questions um, about, you know, how do you do identity and how do you be diverse um, easily in your classroom? So one easy thing is to think about the examples that you're using. Um, think about the, the people that you're pulling from, uh, the histories that you're um, projecting in your courses or the examples that you're utilizing and, and actually creating and thinking about ways to demonstrate multiple perspectives, maybe pulling in women or pulling in underrepresented minorities um, rather than just the traditional, this is my example, move to the next one. Uh, thinking about ways that you can get creative about that. And then the last thing on here is about universal design. Um, and this is, this is something we should be doing no matter what, um, to really serve um, students with disabilities or to serve, you know, multiple modes of learning. But this can be particularly important when thinking about identity because this gives students in universal design its principles that make your class accessible to all students and all modes of learning. Um, and really this is about creating multiple means of representation, multiple ways of expressing yourself and engaging um, with learners and ways to open up your classroom. I would definitely say to um, Google around for universal design principles because those can definitely uh, help move your, your teaching forward. In terms of a system level um, and really thinking beyond your classroom and beyond the individual level, thinking about how you can engage across campus uh, with different partners to make sure that you are looking at your work um, as an identity journey, not only for yourself, but also for the students in your classes. Um, so partnering with campus partners, so, you know, talking to disability services, talking about, um, talking to multicultural student affairs or LGBT groups on campus, how you can be more inclusive uh, within your work. Um, and really understanding that you are a work in progress, you as an educator, myself as an educator, everyone on here, um, we are definitely works in progress. So even though there are many mistakes to be had, um, not being afraid to make mistakes during this process, uh, because I think that's something that keeps people sometimes from moving forward and just knowing that that doesn't have to be uh, something that should scare you. Um, and the final thing I want to leave you with is don't leave your inclusivity um, and identity, you know, kind of study at work. It's really important uh, to very much live this inclusivity that you're wanting to put forward um, and honoring these identities. And if we're only doing it in one course or in one aspect of our life, that's not truly living uh, inclusively. And I think that that, that can definitely show through to students um, and collaborators and partners. 
Um, so making sure that you're definitely living within that space. Um, so I'm more than happy to, to answer questions, and if you have anything specific that you'd like, uh, I'm all open. Thanks so much, Dr. Rodriguez, for connecting this idea of STEM learning with STEM identity and inclusivity. So now, again, we have an opportunity for people to ask questions, post comments, and things. Um, also, really quickly in the chat box, we have a link to a post-event evaluation. We have a couple of your slides, but as you're thinking about questions, um, go ahead and post them on the whiteboard and also in the chat box and grab that link for evaluation. Okay, it looks like um, I'll take the one in the text box first. So how do you deal with pushback against the idea of intersectionality as a legitimate field of study? I've had experience with hostility, especially in STEM, decrying intersectionality as an illegitimate field of study that shouldn't be included in the classroom. That is an excellent question and, wow, delegitimizes an entire field of research. Um, which is exciting. Um, so I think there are two ways that you could handle this, depending on um, the particular, uh, I'm big on audience and knowing your audience and knowing your context. And I think particularly with issues of intersectionality, you have to know your context uh, very well. So the first um, context that I think about here is, you know, if you have some hostility um, about people that think maybe intersectionality isn't valid as um, teaching in a STEM classroom or, you know, um, maybe they don't know or they don't understand that, that it is a legitimate field. So you might try putting it in different terms. So sometimes intersectionality can really be thought of as something negative or something um, very hostile. But sometimes if you back it off, perhaps, and think about intersections or backgrounds, um, people can get a little bit less edgy about it. Um, again, that's part of knowing your context. So like, for instance, you know, sometimes in the Midwest or, you know, someplace there aren't necessarily lots of URMs or women in STEM. Um, I would definitely more take that route. Um, in terms of it being a, a legitimate field, I would definitely also make sure to have your resources at hand um, because part of shifting that change and shifting that hostility is going to be making sure that they understand that not only is this a field of study that is quite legitimate in many different areas, um, it's something that people are talking about um, in STEM circles. So, you know, this is a this is a field that's being brought to, you know, Journal of Engineering Education, um, that's being brought to, you know, iGEMS, um, that they're bringing it to ASWE. Um, so making those connections, I think, can really help. Um, the second question we have here, I'm interested in the intersection of imposter syndrome um, and creating STEM identities in underrepresented groups. Can you speak to that? Wow, imposter syndrome, absolutely. So for those of you who may not know uh, what she or he or she means by, um, or this person means by imposter syndrome, um, imposter syndrome is that feeling, and I know I still feel it every single day, of the fact that you aren't necessarily enough, that you know people will discover um, that you're an imposter and you actually don't really know anything about your particular subject or you got there by some you know, clandestine, like, issue because you were a person of color or you were a woman and affirmative action is the only reason you're there. Um, and so that can create this sort of feeling of imposter syndrome where you don't think you deserve to be in that spot or you don't think you really have the knowledge. Um, so in terms of building a sense of identity in the face of imposter syndrome, 
I think the things that I'm creating STEM identities in um, So I think what this question is getting at is how can we empower our underrepresented students, whether that's women or, or URMs or, or whatnot, um, to be able to really feel a sense of STEM identity. And I think that you can do a couple of things. So I think very like direct things that you can do, like working with individuals, is that you need to be like validating um, their existence in this space. So first of all, saying and reinforcing, you know, for instance, if they're having trouble or, or struggling in some way, as we all do, um, I'm thinking particularly with difficult content, um, making sure that you're reinforcing and validating the fact that they do belong in the STEM community, um, the fact that they are smart, that they are capable or they wouldn't be there. Um, so that's in like interactions like very specifically. I think in classrooms, um, imposter syndrome can be reinforced sometimes by peers. Um, in my own research, I'm looking at Latinas in STEM fields. Uh, particularly white male peers are very difficult groups to to deal with sometimes in terms of um, that group of students and underrepresented women. Um, and really trying in the face of those issues to make sure that not only are we trying to build up, you know, a sense of identity within the students that we care about or within these underrepresented uh, groups of students, but also making sure that we're teaching other students who may be reinforcing imposter syndrome not to do that. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I wish that I could write about right now was, you know, how not to make people feel like they're imposters or how not to be um, crass, but how, how not to be an asshole, uh, essentially, uh, in in class or, or in your interactions. So first of all, yes, like upping the quotient of validation, upping the quotient of, you know, you belong in this space, you are capable, um, giving them opportunities to lead and to be recognized by their peers, but also on the flip side, um, really focusing on the fact that we need to also make sure that our peers, our faculty, and our TAs um, are not pushing imposter syndrome. Um, I want to go back to the first question. Uh, you asked, where can I get good resources um, for intersectionality? And I can definitely provide some of that um, and add those. I think that, you know, looking for uh, Kimberly Kim Crenshaw is kind of the, the mother of intersectionality. Um, also looking to some texts. Um, by Kimberly Griffin, who works specifically with STEM and intersectionality. Um, and then also, of course, going to, um, you know, if you're in engineering, ASWE has lots of resources uh, there that are, are now starting to bridge um, identities and intersectional work. Um, so we can definitely uh, share some of those as well. Um, in terms of intersections of identity, um, I believe that Jones, Abe, those are authors, uh, Jones and Abe has some work on uh, intersections of identity and being able to um, understand that. So I can absolutely make those available. And then the last question here, it looks like, do you have any, do you have a particular exercise you do with students to help them think about their STEM identities? Yes, I do. Um, and there are many, many versions, and I'm sure I would be interested to see if, you know, who all has, has done these. Um, it's a really popular thing to do. So there are identity wheels. Um, there are also uh, exercises that you can do with TAs and faculty. Um, and basically what, what a lot of these are is like one walking people through their identities, and I, I actually did that on a webinar last week. Um, so walking people through, like, what sort of identities do you hold, um, what sort of privileges were had by those identities, what sort of marginalized uh, identities or feelings might you have, um, and then moving that into STEM and how that manifests itself in the STEM context. So I can absolutely add mine, um, and then also uh, some resources about um, other people that are doing them, but yes, identity wheels are, are pretty popular. 
uh, for doing these exercises. Uh, but I think really the key uh, in doing those identity wheels um, is making sure that not only do you talk about you know, the identities that students hold, but really getting them to connect that to their STEM experiences. And then I would say uh, another offshoot of that, if you're doing it with TAs or you're doing it with faculty members, um, connecting that to the larger sort of macro discussion about why these identities are important to marginalizing large groups. So not just you're marginalizing one student, but perhaps you're marginalizing women or women of color or students with disabilities um, and, and moving the conversation beyond like, oh, I need to be nice to I need to honor people's identities and break down the barriers so that they can continue to be in this field. Um, Thank you so much. Oh, um, sorry. Dr. <laughs> yeah. We only have a few minutes left and unfortunately I'm, I see lots of really good questions coming up. But we want to make sure that um, we can get to the next couple of slides. There are more um, workshops coming up. Um, well, oh yes. Yeah. Here's the evaluation link. I forgot about this slide change. Um, if you could fill out the evaluation, and the link is also in the chat box. I'll post it again. And we have been stressing throughout this presentation how um, attending a workshop is just a start, but thinking about equity in terms of a long-term process. We don't have time really to go through some of the reflection activities, but if you wanted to do this later on your own, we wanted you to think about some of the words that you associate with inclusive teaching and learning. And then we also wanted you to consider what's your next step for developing your practice, whether you're an instructor or an administrator, um, making change at the department level or institution level. So we hope that you'll think about those questions. And um, April, it's almost next month, um, there will be additional workshops on inclusive teaching that go through specific disciplines, so focusing on science, engineering, technology, math, and informatics. So those are opportunities to dig deeper and hear from faculty, students, and a lot of different people about um, how to do inclusive teaching and create inclusive learning environments for students. And the few references and these slides will also be available um, for you on the CERTL website at the end. And we'll, we'll also figure out, we'll work with Kate to figure out how we can get additional resources that people are asking about. Thanks, Kate. Thanks so much to Drs. Miller and Drs. Rodriguez for being here today. It was really um, useful, helpful um, information that you shared with us. Thanks so much to all of our speakers and our, our attendees today. Thanks also to Katie and Francesca for organizing this entire series around um, issues of gender equity and inclusion in STEM. This is a wonderful note to end the series on. Um, I'll, I'll say it once more. Once more, Please do take the survey. If you have not filled out your post-event evaluation, we really do value this um, feedback. Um, even though this is the last event in the series, we have three more event series happening this semester, one of which is that uh, series on inclusive teaching, and whatever feedback you give us today will help us build those series out in a more, more productive manner for all of our participants in the network. Um, we'll have slides online after today's event. I'll be in touch with our speakers so that we can share resources on the event page as well. And in a week or so, we'll have a, a copy of this recording online as well for folks to review. So thanks again to everyone, and have a great day.